Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Stephen Romo in for Savannah Sellers today. Right now on Morning News Now, strong messages to the world from both President Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin. Biden is in Poland this morning to deliver a major address just a day after his surprise visit to Ukraine. What we're learning about that secret trip, which was months in the making. Plus, Vladimir Putin addressed the Russian parliament ahead of the one-year anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine, his warning to the West, plus the major announcement about his country's involvement in an international nuclear weapons treaty. Well wishes former President Jimmy Carter as he remains at home in hospice care. We have the latest on his condition and the tributes coming in from his small Georgia hometown and from around the world. Plus, under the microscope, the Supreme Court is about to take a look at the tech world today. The justices will hear arguments in cases that could change how online companies operate, what that could mean for the future of the Internet. Also this morning, fit for a queen. She's made her mark as Miss New York, and now she's taking TikTok by storm. The reigning Miss New York, Taryn Delaney Smith, joins us in studio later this hour with how she's using her platform to make everyone feel like a pageant queen. Very cool. Be looking forward to talking to her. And we're going to ask her to teach us how to do the waves. So yes. I'm excited about I don't know how to do the waves. We'll so. figure that out. But we do begin this morning with the war in Ukraine as we quickly approach that one year mark and a tale of two speeches now from two of the world's most powerful countries. President Biden is in Poland today, one day after that surprising and unprecedented visit to Ukraine, a country that's in the middle of a war. Later this morning, the president will make a landmark speech ahead of the war's one year anniversary, following talks with members of NATO's eastern flank. And earlier this morning in Moscow, President Putin delivered his State of the Nation address. In a bullish speech, Putin accused the West of provoking the conflict and threatening Russia's very existence. Allegations the West strongly denies. The Western elites do not conceal their goals. As they say, it's a direct quote, to bring Russia a strategic defeat. What does it mean? What is it for us? It means to end us once and for all. It means they plan to turn a local conflict into a global confrontation. We understand it exactly like that. We will react to it accordingly. This is because, in this case, it is about the very existence of our country. NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman joins us now from Warsaw, Poland. Josh, before we get more into President Putin's speech, let's focus on where you are in Poland and President Biden's agenda there today. What do we expect to be the big message he delivers today, especially in the wake of that visit to Kyiv? Well, Joe, it was almost one year ago that President Biden was at uh, the Royal Gardens here in Poland, where he delivered a speech just as that war was getting underway, trying to make the case uh, that the U.S., its allies, and Ukraine needed to stand together against Russia's aggression. And here, one year later, uh, White House officials say President Biden will try to expand and build on that message, making the point that the Western coalition really has succeeded seated in holding itself together, in supporting Ukraine, in being able to withstand a Russian war that many had suspected would lead Russia, uh, Ukraine's military to quickly collapse. President Biden uh, trying to send the message as he meets here in Poland with President Duda and tomorrow with leaders from other NATO countries on the eastern flank, that it is more important than ever that countries step up with more weapons, with more economic assistance, and with more diplomatic solidarity with Ukraine to ensure that Russia is not able to use uh, this long-running war and that sense of fatigue to gain an upper hand over Ukraine. Let's talk more about President Putin's speech. We heard him just announce, this is a big headline, Russia suspending its involvement in the new yeah. START nuclear weapons treaty. He also claimed the West provoked the war, something Western leaders would strongly disagree with. What else did he say? Did we learn anything new about his plans now going into the second year of this war? Well, he didn't offer a lot of new details about his strategy other than to say Russia uh, plans to continue to try to achieve its objectives in Ukraine. But this was a significant announcement in terms of ending, at least for now, Russia's participation in the new START treaty, the last remaining arms agreement between the United States and Russia. And it wasn't totally unsurprising unsur uh, in that Russia had already stopped allowing uh, the U.S. to inspect uh, its sites, its military sites 
sites under that agreement, first during COVID and then citing the war in Ukraine. But it's really a sign of just how much relations between the U.S. and Russia have deteriorated since the start of this war. President Putin using that address to say it is the fault of the West and the U.S. that this war is taking place, not Russia's. Take a listen. Responsibility for fomenting the Ukrainian conflict for its escalation and for the increasing number of victims lies entirely with the Western elites. And of course, the current regime in Kyiv, for which the Ukrainian people are essentially strangers. We heard Putin once again uh, talking about the history of Ukraine's relationship with Russia, trying to make the case uh, that it is Russia's responsibility to protect and defend Russian speakers in Ukraine, and that Russia simply came to the aid uh, of its own people in Ukraine who needed their help. That, of course, is a historical narrative that the U.S. says is completely bogus. And Josh, real quickly, I have to ask you that extraordinary visit by President Biden to Kiev yesterday. How did the White House pull that off? They pulled it off, first of all, by keeping it limited to a very small handful of officials who even knew the president was leaving. He slipped out of Washington under cover of darkness at about 4 a.m., uh, flying to Poland, then taking about a 10-hour train ride uh, into Kyiv. Uh, the White House says that they, in fact, informed Russia ahead of time that President Biden was going to be in Kyiv because they didn't want to risk any possibility that Russia would do anything while President Biden was on the ground there that could risk his safety. Joe. All right, Josh Letterman, another busy day in Eastern Europe. Thanks so much, Josh. Well, prayers and well wishes continue to pour in for former President Jimmy Carter. This after the Carter Foundation announced over the weekend that the 98-year-old has entered hospice care at his home. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell has the latest from Plains, Georgia. President's Day has a special poignancy in Plains, Georgia, where decades of community pride embraces a favorite son. It's a good opportunity to say, you know, we recognize what you've done for our country. We thank you for that. Bill Clinton noted this holiday to send good wishes to Jimmy Carter, the 39th president, who returned home to this house here in Plains to spend his remaining days in hospice care close to Rosalind his wife of 76 years. Do you feel this personally? Oh, definitely. He deserves to know, he should know what, pe what he meant to people and what he will always mean to people and represent to this country. Secure in his faith and his place in history. At 98, Jimmy Carter has lived longer than any American president. He reflected on facing his final days after surviving brain cancer in 2015. I've had a wonderful life. I've had thousands of friends and, and uh, I've had an exciting and adventurous and gratifying existence. The Carter Center and his local church are posting messages and memories from the public. Habitat for Humanity honored his nearly four decades of sweat and spirit by wishing him comfort and well-being. By choosing hospice, the former president can still receive care to keep him comfortable, but not medical intervention that would prolong his life. All right, Kelly O'Donnell, thanks so much. The Supreme Court is set to hear two cases this week that could potentially shape the future of Internet content and how it's moderated. At stake is whether social media and tech companies can be held liable for certain recommendations to their users. Yeah, for more on what we can expect, let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. We're also joined by CNBC contributor and Wall Street Journal reporter Tim Higgins. Good morning to you both. Thanks for being there, being here. Danny, let's start with you. This case, Google versus Gonzalez, a lot of interest in in this one. It stems from the 2015 ISIS attack in Paris. We know that this college student there, Noemi Gonzalez, she, uh, her parents making this argument against Google. What do we know about this case? The family has sued uh, YouTube or Google. These are companion cases. Google, Gonzalez v. Google, Google, and another one against Twitter. And they have somewhat different uh, goals, but very similar facts. Uh, for example, in the YouTube case, the plaintiffs are saying essentially that YouTube aided 
and abetted terrorism by its recommendation algorithm. You know, when you go on YouTube and you watch stuff, it recommends new things and it automatically plays them when your video ends. So the plaintiffs are arguing in that case that by making those recommendations, Google is aiding and abetting terrorism. Or excuse me, well, Google and YouTube, they're essentially the same. Mm. YouTube is arguing, no, it's just an algorithm. And as long as we treat all people the same, we're not uh, specially recommending things to terrorists, then we should be in the clear. The Twitter case is interesting only because the Ninth Circuit in the case below found for the families, not that they win, but that their case can go forward. So you have somewhat different outcomes at the lower courts because YouTube has won in the Gonzalez case at every level. So it'll be interesting what the Supreme Court does with this kind of split under in the cases below. Tim, let's bring you into this conversation. The tech industry has been criticized for not doing enough to remove harmful material from the Internet. Can you give us more insight into how companies right now are shielded under the Communications Decency Act? Yeah, this goes back more than 25 years. And essentially, Congress was deciding how the Internet would operate. Would it be like a newspaper or a television station that can be held liable for defamation or other uh, legal issues? Or is it going to be more like a town square where voices can go and be heard and uh, the town square is not going to get sued? Essentially, it would be like if I was on the phone and I was defaming you, you're not going to be able to sue AT&T. And so that's kind of the way Congress went, that this is a town square. And really the, the foundation for what we have now with Facebook and Twitter and all these social media companies, what's changed, however, is, is, is the business model. These uh, companies are so sophisticated now at targeting that information to you that now the question is, is the algorithm uh, that's ge generating this content to you, is that protected as well? Uh, so really a key kind of going forward, uh, because if this was to be struck down or narrowed in some way, it could be very expensive, very co costly, time consuming for these companies to try to redo how they kind of put third party and third party content out to the world. Mm, have yeah. to reinvent the wheel, it sounds like. So, Danny, we know Twitter's getting a lot of attention uh, lately, including this case coming up on Wednesday. What else do we know about it and, and how it differs from the one with Google? Interestingly enough, even the parties seem to agree that factually these cases are nearly identical. But in the Twitter case, the family suing Twitter is basically generally alleging that Twitter aided and abetted terrorism under federal anti-terrorism laws, which allows the family to sue in court and get uh, triple damages even. So that case is moving forward. Doesn't mean they win. The difference between the YouTube cases, that's about the algorithm. There's a more concrete thing there that the plaintiffs are alleging is assisting uh, terrorism mm. in that it recommends things to terrorists to watch to help them. Not necessarily either plaintiffs are going to win, but this is about whether their cases move forward. And I'll take an even darker view. Yep. If the, the court comes down on the side of the families in both of these cases, it could change the Internet the way we know it, because what Internet provider, what platform in their right mind would allow anyone's user-generated content if they know they may be liable down the road for terrorism. So we wow. would expect that decision from the Supreme Court by the end of June. Tim, what are the ramifications of this decision? Tanny just suggested what they could be. I mean, how, how will this case potentially shape the future of the Internet? Yeah, Microsoft, a warning in, in one of its filings that uh, inevitably uh, these platforms are going to l allow less uh, information from third parties out on these sites just because of the, the, the potential liability there. Uh, the other concern here is kind of the litigation that these companies would face going into the future. You can imagine all of the content on there, what would potentially generate a lawsuit, not that they would win it, but, uh, you know, the kind of the, the time consume of all of that. And just, uh, you know, the idea that uh, these platforms would not allow for the same kind of uh, creativity that you see there now. So, you know, the, the concerns there are that essentially it would change uh, how these uh, platforms operate on the day to day. Wow. Some potential ramifications here. Definitely something to watch. Danny and Tim, thank you. Later today, the Ohio Department of Health is expected to open a clinic at a church in East Palestine. It would care for anyone who has been sick since a train derailed there more than two weeks ago, sending toxic fumes into the air. NBC News correspondent George Solis is there with the latest. Residents say over the last three weeks, they've seen a lot of movement in their town from local leaders, politicians. But the reality is they just want assurances that their air and water are safe. 
More anger mounting in East Palestine. We're so far out and we still don't have answers. Shelby Walker's home is near the toxic train derailment site. We have no choice to live here right now. Walker says just days after the derailment, she started feeling sick. I have lost my sense of smell and taste since then. Some respiratory issues. She says she's tested negative for COVID and that her doctor was unable to explain her symptoms. Ongoing EPA testing of the air and water has not yet shown a threat to the community, according to the agency. Still, some residents say they aren't convinced. I'm very frustrated. We don't think they're taking care of um, all the pollution that they should be. U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg urging Northwork Southern and other rail companies to drop previous resistance to certain regulations the agency says would improve safety on America's rails. In a strongly worded letter to CEO Alan Shaw, Buttigieg says the people of East Palestine cannot be forgotten, nor can their pain be simply considered the cost of doing business. Shaw making an unannounced visit this weekend to East Palestine. Norfolk Southern says it's paid out more than 2.6 million to residents and business owners for their losses. But Walker says the damage is done. You want answers? I'm not here to put blame. It was an accident. It was a horrible, horrible accident. But I do blame for them not saying, hey, this is what we need to do. Our thanks to George Solis. And in addition to that health clinic opening today, the head of the EPA is expected to be in town to address health concerns and provide an update on the federal response. All right, turning now to a check of your weather this morning. Yeah, meteorologist Angie Lassman joins us now with the latest on a winter weather system that's headed for the west. Angie, good morning. The west and beyond, guys. Good morning. We're going to see many people impacted by this same storm system over the coming days. And you can see these alerts, the winter ones, are already up for 35 million people extending from the west coast all the way into the Midwest for places like Michigan to California and up the west coast. This is what we're going to be expecting uh, as far as we get through the next couple of days. Some snow, some difficult travel when we add in some strong winds as well uh, and even some severe weather on the the southern side of this and some icing as well so we've really got a mixed bag of a lot of things to deal with here's how it plays out your future tracker showing you that system that dives down from Canada it does bring places like the northern Rockies some snow through the day today we'll see that working in and uh, the gusty winds as well I'll show you exactly how high those winds could get here in a moment but notice how it spreads across the northern tier of the country as well so places like the high plains and into the Midwest could see some snow We'll talk about the totals in a moment, but also notice this uh, wintry mix, the freezing rain that we'll deal with that will allow for some accumulating ice, as well as some rain that's stretched down through parts of the Tennessee Valley as well. Some thunderstorms will be impacting folks there too. There's a secondary push of some of that snow that works through the Midwest, and eventually by the time we get later into the week, say Thursday and into the early parts of Friday, we could see some of this snow impacting folks for the interior areas of the Northeast. So let's talk about the accumulation amounts first. Here's the, the latest. We could see uh, maybe up to a foot for Salt Lake City, over a foot for Rapid City. But check out these numbers from Minneapolis. Really uh, a, a substantial snowfall expected. Over two feet is possible here as we get through Thursday. So again, you add in some of those winds that we'll expect and travel will be really difficult. When it comes to the Northeast, we're looking at about an inch for Boston. The interior areas like Burlington could see up to nine inches. So not quite as much still causing some issues over the next couple of days. Here's those wind alerts. 60 3 million people are included in this, mostly focused towards the west uh, of the United States. But look at these gusts, 60 miles per hour is as high as we could see them. That likely will cause some power outages, some down trees, blowing snow. This is why the travel over the next few days is going to be a little iffy. Now, on the flip side of that, uh, it feels like summer in some spots. 86 degrees, guys, today in Dallas. It's going to be more than 20, even 30 degrees warmer than normal in a lot of places. It's not just today, even tomorrow, since Cincinnati in the low 70s, St. Louis in the low 70s, Atlanta, you're going to hit 78 degrees. And uh, it was a gorgeous day yesterday in New York, and these temperatures are going to still be fairly mild even through Thursday. Philadelphia hits 71 degrees. By Friday, it drops to 48, and Saturday, we're at 37. So it's a little bit of weather whiplash, but we mm. could see more than 100 cities uh, break some record highs. There's potential for record-breaking highs in a lot of places over the next few days. Um, so really a mixed bag out there, if you will. I love seeing Richmond go from 83 to the 40s Ooh. in like <laughs> less than three days. It's, yeah, it's, it's incredible. And there's some severe weather with that system, so lots to track. All yeah. right. Thanks, Angie. Appreciate it. All right. And coming up on Morning News Now, a legal break for Alec Baldwin. Prosecutors have dropped one of the charges 
from the deadly shooting on the set of the movie Rust. What this means for Baldwin's case and the length of a potential jail sentence if he's convicted. Plus, the Biden administration could soon be facing a major immigration lawsuit over a potential plan aimed at blocking many migrants from entering the country. We'll explain next. We're back now with a legal win for Alec Baldwin in connection with that deadly shooting on the New Mexico set of the Western movie Rust. The district attorney in this case has dropped the gun enhancement charge against him, which could have brought a mandatory five-year prison sentence if he was convicted. NBC News correspondent Maura Barrett has more. The district attorney's decision to drop these charges came as a surprise and yet another twist in this case around the rush shooting that happened in October of 2021. Prosecutors uh, saying that they made this decision in order to, quote, avoid further litigious distractions, while Baldwin's team argued that the prosecutors committed a, quote, basic legal error. Now, basically, the firearm enhancement charge is something that is added on a part of the criminal code if a crime is committed with use of a firearm, and that taxed on a mandatory five years to the charge. And basically, there was a little bit of a technical mix up here. The prosecutors uh, exercising this charge, the latest version of that law in New Mexico, though, was put into place in May of 2022, seven months after that incident. And so Baldwin's attorneys uh, saying that it doesn't apply based on the timing of the incident back in October of 2021. And the, the prosecutors are saying that this is yet another distraction uh, that they're seeing from Baldwin's team. But in reality, a lot of legal experts are saying that this could indicate a weak case on the side of the prosecution. And again, this meant uh, that uh, the potential of an addition of five years if sentenced uh, goes away. Baldwin is still facing uh, potentially 18 months uh, if convicted because of that involuntary manslaughter charge. Uh, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, the weapons supervisor that was on set, is facing this, a similar charge as well. That gun en uh, enhancement charge also dropped against her. We expect to see both of them in court appearing virtually on Friday. This will be the first time that they appear in court as this trial uh, gets underway. And this could be bumped up against the news that we heard just last week uh, as the filming for Rust is set to start again uh, this spring. So again, we'll see Baldwin and Gutierrez read for the first time in court on Friday. Back to you. All right, Maura, thank you. Immigration advocates are threatening to sue the Biden administration over a potential plan that could block migrants from entering the country. Under this new rule, migrants would be ineligible from seeking asylum in the U.S. unless they first try to claim asylum in another country that they pass through on the way to the southern border, like Mexico. That's according to exclu exclusive new reporting from NBC's Julia Ainsley. And Julia joins us now with more. Good to have you with us. So walk us through this new proposed rule and what it would mean for millions of people looking to come to the country, especially those entering through the southern border. Well, this is widely expected to be announced in the coming weeks. I'm hearing weeks, not months, Joe. And this would be what they call a notice for proposed rulemaking. And basically, that's a federal government's way of saying, we want to go forward with this rule, allowing for a comment period. But really, it's something that they can put forward only to be challenged by courts. They don't need Congress to do this. And what it would do is exactly like you said, make migrants ineligible for asylum if they did not first try to claim asylum in another country. Now, it does make some exceptions for people who might have have a fear of being tortured, for example, but that's a higher bar migrants will have to meet. And the way the government wants to do this is to make migrants do a very quick interview in Border Patrol custody so that if they don't qualify, they're quickly expelled or deported back to Mexico. Now, some of those details are still being worked out with the Mexican government. But what we do understand is that legal groups, immigration rights activists and, and uh, legal advocates, are already preparing a lawsuit to challenge this this policy because they say it's exactly like a policy created under the Trump administration by his immigration hardliner advisor, Stephen Miller. And it's one that they challenged then and one that they plan to challenge again now. It really shows how the, this administration has become a little uh, harder on immigration than what a lot of these groups expected from President Biden and what he campaigned on when he said he wanted to go back to a safe, orderly and humane immigration policy. But in part, they're being driven by the numbers. We've seen record numbers of migrants crossing the border. And Secretary Mayorkas says that they want to open up more legal pathways. They've opened up some already, but our reporting shows they don't expect to be opening up any more pathways, particularly for Central Americans, anytime soon. So, Julia, I mean, the fact that critics are comparing Biden policies with Trump era policies, I mean, you're the expert here. Is it accurate to make those comparisons? Are the policies similar? 
Well, it is hard to see the policy in a vacuum. It's true that the Trump administration did not try to open up more pathways for people like we're seeing right now from Cuba, Haiti, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, where those people can apply from their home countries and they'll let in 30,000 collectively from those four per month. That didn't exist under the Trump administration. But if you look at this policy on its own, it really does look a lot like what happened then. And I've spoken to some former Biden administration officials who say when they weighed these options earlier in the administration, they said, no way, it's not legal, we won't go there. So it does show that they have slid down that scale, at least in part. And it also shows where we are in this country on this issue, because right now, while these groups are threatening to sue for them being too hard on migrants, we also have Republican-led states suing the administration for being too lenient. There's really very few policies they can put forward now, Joe, that they won't wind up in court over. And Julia, very quickly, I know you spoke to representatives with some of these groups that are planning to sue. Looking at recent re rulings, I mean, do they think they'd win in court? It all depends on the circuit. And you can maybe see it is very hard to get through the Fifth Circuit in Texas, but the Ninth Circuit in California could be much more lenient. In fact, it was the Ninth Circuit who, under the Trump administration, said that this was an unlawful policy. But it all is kind of up in the air when it comes to the Supreme Court. You know, we've seen the court go more conservative recently, so it may be uh, that they find that the, the advocates in this case don't have a case. Uh, but right now, we will see a lot more about their thinking when they do, in fact, take oral arguments on March 1st and then maybe make a ruling later on Title 42, those COVID-19 restrictions that Republicans want to keep in place at the border. So we're watching that to see where this court stands on immigration. All right, Julia, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. All right, to international headlines now. Turkey once again reeling this morning after another powerful earthquake. NBC's Claudio Lavanga joins us from Rome with that and more world news. Claudio, good morning. Good morning. Yes, Turkish authorities say that Monday's earthquake struck the southern city of Antakya, killing at least six people and injuring hundreds more. Now, the 6.3 earthquake rattled once again the border between Turkey and Syria two weeks after a larger earthquake has killed at least 47,000 people. The new quake reduced to rubble buildings already damaged by the previous seismic wave and rattled the nerves of millions of people living in the area, many of whom are still sleeping in temporary shelters. Now, let's go to Brazil, where officials say at least 40 people died from Monday's flooding and landslides caused by heavy rain. Authorities say the death toll could rise as dozens of people are still missing. Brazil's president, Lula da Silva, visited the region and said homes should no longer be built in areas at risk of landslides and major floods. Let's move to South Korea, where a court has recognized the legal rights of same-sex couples in the country for the first time. A government health insurer initially withdrew the coverage of the spouse of a cons of customer when it found out the couple were gay. The man had a wedding ceremony in 2019, even if same-sex marriage is not recognized in South Korea. Now, in a landmark ruling, the Seoul High Court ruled that the spouse must be covered by his husband's insurance. Stephen, Joe. All right, big ruling there. Claudio, thanks so much. All right, to our next story now. We know not all heroes wear capes. And this morning, we're taking a look at how one Marine veteran made it his mission to help a girl reunite with her dog, which was being held for ransom. NBC News correspondent Katie Beck has more on that story. It's a terrifying image for any dog owner, a stranger lurking outside to steal your pet. It hurt my heart, you know, to hear her crying. It was I'm rough. Sure. And she couldn't sleep. This ring camera footage captured 12 year old Samaje Witherspoon's Yorkie Avery being dog napped outside her Landover, Maryland home. A teenager is seen enticing the dog with treats. Then she and a male accomplice make off with the dog in plain sight. Right away, a missing flyer went up. Then came a text message from the dog nappers with a ransom demand on a photo of poor Avery in a cage. With Raquel me. Witherspoon first called police. Then the news. Just Avery, he's out here, out there. We don't know. Her story caught the attention of highly trained tracking expert, former Marine veteran Rick Mackhammer, who once tracked members of Al Qaeda. He's also a dog owner. I couldn't imagine if someone kidnapped my dog. So he put his paid job on the back burner and made finding Avery his mission, tracing the ransom number to a social media page where he saw a similar image of the woman on the ring video. He was getting close, really close. He was on it. He was. He, he's really good. 
He found the dog, shared his intel with police. With a search warrant, Avery was recovered and a suspect charged. How does this rank in terms of, of victories that you've had in your... Oh, this is probably the, the best one. Avery's still a little skittish, home safe and sound. A homecoming and a first meeting in person for the rescue team. Thank you so much. What does that mean to you? I'm just very thankful. Not a lot of people would jump right on it. A wrong turned right, a mission that matters. Those of us who have dogs understand just how important they are. Even when the hostage has four legs. Katie Beck, NBC News, Landover, Maryland. Like a little mini Dateline wow. episode there. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> yeah, good ending. Too. All right, coming up on Morning News Now, a break in the case. Police have arrested a man in the murder of a popular L.A. Catholic bishop. Up next, his alleged connection to the victim. Also this morning, breaking the stigma, Senator John Fetterman remains in a treatment facility for depression. So how common is depression among men? And could a high-profile name like Fetterman's help other men get treatment? An expert joins us to explain, coming up next. We're back now with the latest on the fatal shooting of a beloved Catholic bishop in L.A. The husband of Bishop David O'Connell's housekeeper is now in custody. Here's NBC News correspondent Nyella Charles. The suspect arrested in the shooting death of a high-ranking and beloved Los Angeles Catholic bishop. This man, this bishop, made a huge difference in our community. He was loved. And, uh, and, it's, and it's very sad that we're gathered here today uh, to talk about his murder in this way. Investigators say the suspect is 65-year-old Carlos Medina, the husband of the bishop's housekeeper, and that he had done work around the bishop's residence. Detectives were told by the tipster that they were concerned because Medina was acting strange, irrational, and made comments about the bishop owing him money. 69-year-old Bishop David O'Connell was found bleeding and not breathing at his home in Los Angeles this weekend from an apparent gunshot wound on his upper body, according to deputies. Investigators saying it was a targeted attack. It was very shocking to me. I'm getting chills right now, just thinking about it. Having spent most of his priesthood ministering to South LA communities afflicted with poverty and gang violence, O'Connell became known as LA's peacemaker and was admirably called Bishop Dave. He was very interested in trying to be a mediator between the police and the community. He was somebody that, you know, police officers and gang members and humble community people all, you know, gravitated to. His compassion extended to immigrants. He supported the immigration or asylum claims of more than 75 unaccompanied minors through a SoCal immigration task force. He called it a labor of love. Attorney Linda Dakin Grimm worked with Bishop O'Connell's task force. Welcoming the stranger had always been a passion of his. He has been an amazing supporter of all the kids and families that I've represented quietly behind the scenes without seeking attention. The Archdiocese of Los Angeles saying in a statement that it is deeply disturbed and saddened by this news. The respected faith leader originally from Ireland had served the Los Angeles area for more than 45 years and was named an auxiliary bishop by Pope Francis in 2015. I knew I'd lost a great friend. I knew that L.A. had lost, you know, a great bishop. Bishop Barron was ordained with O'Connell. I woke up to the news that he had been shot. Uh, so that just double the the shock and the surprise that's part of the um, trauma of this thing for all of us is we just find it so hard to understand detectives are still investigating if a dispute led to all of this they say they did perform a search warrant at medina's home where they recovered two firearms and other evidence possibly linking him to the murder of the bishop they say his wife is cooperating and although he isn't charged they say he is in custody as they continue to go over forensics meanwhile the people in los angeles are remembering bishop dave's legacy they say he helped the helpless and gave hope to the hopeless Back to you. All right, Nyala, thank you. Time for our weekly mental health check-in. We're taking a closer look at Senator John Fetterman's decision to seek treatment for depression. Plus, bullying is no longer playground fights or getting shoved into lockers. So we have tips on how to address those new forms of bullying. Let's bring in psychotherapist and author Naro Feliciano. So good morning. Thanks for being here. And let's start with Senator John Fetterman and his decision to seek treatment for his depression. So it made us wonder just how common is depression among men and why do men struggle so much to get treatment? And maybe could a, a senator announcement like this, could it help break that stigma? 
That is all right. And depression is so common. One in five people deal with depression, a mental health related condition, and especially in professions that are high stress, politicians, doctors, lawyers, teachers, we see a lot of high functioning depression. What he's done is normalize the conversation on depression. He's pointed to the fact that our brain is a part of our body like anything else that needs care and attention. And when we seek treatment, we can better our mental health and also our physical health because there's no physical health without mental health. Every story like this does help break that stigma, which is important as we have these conversations. All right, let's talk about a new study published in the PLOS One Journal. It found that bullying among kids has changed. It still exists, but identity bullying, which includes making fun of someone for their sexual orientation or their gender, is now the leading cause of distress among kids. So why has bullying changed? And then really most importantly, how can parents help kids who are being bullied? Any parent who has a child with a cell phone knows that bullying has changed. It has become more cyber-based. And what our research shows that actually physical bullying, the physical confrontations, don't have the same type of impact on our mental health as social bullying, gender identity bullying, any type of identity bullying, where we see a higher risk of mental illness in kids, including, including suicidal ideation and intent. And the best thing we can do is talk to our kids, be involved, in the conversations they're having, especially on text, and work with parents of other kids as well as the schools to, to come up with solutions. We can't leave that responsibility solely on the kid to work it out themselves. Some great tips there. And before we get to our next question, we do want to add if anyone is struggling with their mental health, they can reach out or text call the Suicide and Crisis Hotline at 988. And we also wanted to ask about uh, so-called uh, mommy brain this morning. Many viewers have heard of it. Many have even experienced it, maybe the idea of this brain fog that happens both during and sometimes after pregnancy. Walk us through this. And does this affect mental health during pregnancy? As a mother of four kids, I love this topic. Yes, it's somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy because we're expecting with mommy brain to see forgetfulness. We identify and are more attuned to it. But 80% of women do report that type of forgetfulness, we think, because they're attuned to it at the beginning. I am just going to ask, I don't think either of you have been pregnant. I could be wrong. But do you experience forgetfulness in your day-to-day? -day? Constantly. Don't require pregnancy, <laughs> yes, all the time. Okay. It's a normal part of life, but what we're seeing in the research is that there's not enough information to point out the cognitive capacities that have increased during parenthood and motherhood. And I can tell you that even though I have moments of forgetfulness, my capacity to do more in a day has probably increased 80% since I've had kids. So we need more research that points to the positive attributes in our cognitive functioning as parents and mothers. That is a great point. I love that. Nero Feliciano, thanks so much for your insight this morning. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Coming up, spring break, break travel is about to get a little bit easier for families. Yeah, up next, the major change coming to one airline that will save them money the next time they have to book those tickets. You're watching Morning News Now. A food street vendor in San Diego is speaking out after he says he was berated by a group of women while on the job. It was all caught in a video that has gone viral. As the NBC News correspondent and News Now anchor Gotti Schwartz explains, it's the latest in a recent in a series of attacks on these vendors across the U.S. In a viral video, a California street vendor named Andres Arguellos Alvarez says he was bullied by a group of young women. What do you need? Another hot dog. Should we move? No. In it, you can see four young women lined up against the vendor's grill. One woman starts to berate him for his prices. The vendor says he asked them to leave. Instead, two women start grabbing and throwing his food. The video has now been seen more than two million times. The vendor telling Noticias Telemundo how it all made him feel. Me agarraron el bacon con la mano, todos mis vegetales, todo lo que ocupo. Ellas se dieron cuenta pues que yo no, yo era mexicano, que yo no hablaba muy bien inglés y pensaron, ah, a él podemos atacarlo. The student who recorded the video explained on TikTok that she did not know the women involved. I'd much rather just show the world how these girls go out in public and act than get myself involved. Also, I mean, for everyone saying that we should have said something, we did. After this video, we did say something.
The hot dog vendor is also the sweetest man. The vendor did nothing to provoke this. It was just the girls coming into it, angry and drunk and ready to start something. A spokesperson for Cal State San Marcos said a current and two former students were among the group of women involved. Telling NBC News the women's behavior is, quote, disrespectful and the school's dean of students is currently reviewing all available information. Adding, if applicable, we plan to pursue any violations of our student code of conduct. The women haven't been accused of a crime, but the video comes as attacks against street vendors in California are on the rise. In Los Angeles, which has around 10,000 street vendors, robberies targeting street vendors doubled last year. Just this Saturday, police arrested a man they say attacked a street vendor in San Jose with a baseball bat. The video recorded by the man attacked. It was the second attack on a San Jose food vendor in the last week. Last Thursday, an Oakland street vendor was brutally beaten while selling hot dogs when a customer attacked him. And though California has decriminalized street vending and even expanded protections, some activists say it's still an uphill battle. Como yo, yo sé que hay miles de personas que viven esto todos los días. Disturbing stuff. Gotti Schwartz reporting there. By the way, the names of the students involved in that have not been publicly released. Turning now to some financial news, American households continue to rack up debt at record rates. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other news. Good morning, Silvana. Steve and Joe, good morning to you. Yes, yeah, so Americans are racking up a mountain of debt. A report from WalletHub shows household debt jumped to $17 trillion last year. That's the highest level since the financial crisis in 2008. The average household owes a total of nearly $143,000. The increase comes as mortgage rates surge amid high inflation and rising interest rates. The report comes just days after the New York Fed reported credit card balances hit nearly $1 trillion in the fourth quarter of last year. Meta is launching a paid subscription service to allow users to verify their accounts. CEO Mark Zuckerberg says the aim is to increase security and authenticity across the company's social media apps and help creators grow their audience. The service will cost $11.99 a month for Facebook and Instagram accounts that sign up through a web browser or $14.99 a month for subscriptions through Android or iOS devices. Tests will begin in Australia and New Zealand this week and may expand to the U.S. and other countries in the coming months. Ant-Man takes a quantum leap at the box office. The third movie in the Marvel franchise, earning $104 million over the holiday weekend, according to Comscore. Now, that makes it the third highest grossing film ever in February, behind the original Deadpool and the first Black Panther. Now, it's also the first major studio franchise movie of the year, with studios and theaters hoping to see more progress and sales rebounding from the pandemic, guys. Yeah, between that and Avatar, it looks like folks are going back yeah. to the theater. So, all yeah. right. Yeah. Some things are looking thanks good. so much. Sure thing. The spring break travel rush is just weeks away now, and one of the nation's biggest airlines is changing its rules to make it cheaper for some families to sit together. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello explains. Countdown to spring break, and United Airlines, like all airlines under White House pressure, is changing its family seating policy, making it easier for accompanying adults to sit next to children younger than 12 without paying extra. It comes after President Biden targeted extra airline fees during his State of the Union address. Baggage fees are bad enough. Airlines can't treat your child like a piece of baggage. United says its reservation system will automatically place 11 and unders with an adult who is traveling with them, when necessary, making preferred seats available without a fee. The airline industry says carriers try to seat families together often at the gate, but families sometimes book seats together that cost more. Meanwhile, whether you're seeking snow or sun this spring, airfares are costing up to 40% more than a year ago. Domestic fares in March and April now averaging 264 a ticket, hundreds more for some destinations. Hotels averaging 316 per night, up 64% in one year. Start monitoring flight prices now to the destinations you have in mind. Expect to book by the first week in March to get the lowest prices. Be flexible. Depart on your flight midweek to save an average of $100 off airfare. Don't expect any empty middle seats. The TSA screened 2.5 million people on Friday, the most since Thanksgiving weekend. If you haven't bought your ticket, book soon. Prices could rise by hundreds of dollars as spring break draws closer. Back to you. All right, Tom, thank you so much.
All right, coming up this morning, from the stage to your For You page. We'll introduce you to the current Miss New York, who is using her platform to inspire users on TikTok. She joins us next. You are watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. Typically, getting the older model of a smartphone will save you money, but we found an exception. <laughs> a factory-sealed, first-generation iPhone has sold at auction for $63,300. That's about Ooh. 100 times the original price. It was sold online through LCG Auctions. Steve Jobs, of course, unveiled the company's first smartphone back in 2007, featuring an innovative touchscreen. It quickly became Apple's trademark product and would win Time Magazine's Invention of the Year. The seller of that iPhone we just talked about said she got it as a gift, but she already had a new phone, so it just sat unopened on her shelf. Needless to say, she wow. made a little bit of money on it in the end. Yeah, they look so <laughs> small, too. I know. Remember how tiny they were? Yeah. I still have. I can't use it like my iPhone 4. And they're oh, like so yeah. small. Also so small. Yeah. yeah. Blast from the past. Right. Well, finally this hour, we have a guest who probably looks a little familiar to you. Taryn Delaney Smith has a massive TikTok following more than 700,000 people. And she has taken the internet by storm with her hilarious and relatable content. Here's an example. Me sing never. Uh, no. Oh, not Sarah, an accountant. Dance battle or a foot race. Those are two challenges I will never step away from. And if that was not enough, she's also the reigning Miss New York. Taryn Delaney Smith joins us now. Good morning. So happy to have you with us. Hi. Thanks thank for you hanging. for having me. Very That's cool. Great. We know you're wearing quite a few hats or crowns, I guess, yeah. in this <laughs> case. We understand you worked at a call center. So yeah. how does it feel to see where you are now? Yeah, you know, I've been a waitress. I've been a dog walker. I have cleaned apartments. Like, I've cleaned toilets and floors, um, which I think is just part of living in New York. You know, people who, New Yorkers have grit. They hustle. And so I'm so proud to represent the state of New York, mainly because I, you know, I've, this city's really um, built me up as a person, and I'm really grateful for that experience. You are the first Black New York to be crowned with your natural hair. Yes. You also talk candidly about being bullied, and also about the importance of just loving yourself. I mean, yeah. to to win this crown, what does it mean for you? What's the message you hope to send? I think it's really, it's not about me, which might sound cliche, but I've realized throughout this year that this is about the young, especially the young women I meet who see themselves in me. I didn't see growing up um, anybody in positions that I wanted to hold that looked like me, um, especially being crowned with my natural hair. I at one point was told to never compete with my hair natural, to always compete with it straightened. And so for me to win Miss New York in my last year um, competing at 26, I'm the oldest Miss New York they've had so far. Um, it was. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know. Oh, you actually wow. recently raised the age limit of Miss America to 28. Oh, all right. So now they will, there will be more older Miss, Miss New Yorks yeah. than me. But um, and also for me, being a comedian, being a funny gal on TikTok, I really want to give women license to be their to be themselves. I think that women often are made to feel that they have to make themselves smaller to be accepted, to be successful. And I just don't buy that. I don't, I don't buy it. I don't like it. And so I really feel like I'm pushing the envelope in that way. I want women to be themselves, be loud, be bold, and take up space. You are hilarious, and your authenticity really shines through in your videos. It's Thanks. definitely clear to see. You mentioned uh, this is, of course, I'm sure it's been a whirlwind. You give up the title this year. What's next for you here? OK, you really don't know? Yeah. I want one of your jobs. Oh, I want to do what okay. you guys do. I think it's this is so cool. surprisingly yeah. easy. Yeah. <laughs> so true. Yeah. yeah. I want to do this, so NBC. Uh, it, it, we, it, little did you know, this is your audition. This was an interview. Really? Y'all yeah. hiring? Y'all hiring back there? Let me know. Yeah. Cool. That is awesome. OK, so we teased this earlier, but we need some help with our pageant wave. Oh. Because yeah. I feel like, is that even a thing? I feel did like they as a child, now? they taught me elbow, elbow, They used wrist, to do this. Wrist, wrist. Yeah. But listen, now, like, what's the... Listen, I've been in many a parade, yeah. and I'm in Miss New York. I'm hitting them with the. Hey, there you go. Okay. Yeah. You're doing some points. Sometimes I punch the air a little bit. I don't know why. I yeah, do that. some cardio. It's, in it's there. weird when you're in a parade and everyone's staring at you. You don't really know what to do with your hands. Right, right. So I always end up like dancing. I don't know. So I don't know if this exists anymore. Oh. Okay, I think we've a, done away with this. I, yeah. I prefer the finger because guns. it's completely unnatural. It seems too, very This is so I mean, weird. Just, yeah. like, don't do it. I'm glad it's gone. Yeah. Don't do it. Air punches are so much better. Air, I love yeah, that. Right. yeah. We are. We're good to do that. And then. Uh, we're not going to do a foot race because 
A, there's no room in here and you'd win. But totally. You, you like a foot I'm race? I'm fast. <laughs> and I'm fast in heels. I've chased wow. many a oh, cab really? down in full okay. stilettos. If you miss New York, that's actually a job at Quest. I make it that's, you one have to. The, that's one of the new parts of the competition, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I like that a lot. All oh, right. Yeah. Chasing a cab. Taryn Delaney Smith, it has been a pleasure Thank chatting you. with you. You'll be sitting next to us here probably any time now. Fingers so crossed. a lot of fun. All right. Fingers crossed. Thank All right. you guys. Thanks so for much. joining us. That does it for this hour of morning news now. But your news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.